Hey guys, if you're shopping for knives and gear, make sure you check out the description of the video you're watching right now for a link to my Amazon store, where I've compiled some of the very best items available, including some of my own personal recommendations. Thanks! What's going on YouTube Metal Complex here, and today I've got another interesting knife review slash knife overview to share with you guys. This is the Hogue EX A01 Automatic Knife. Uh, Hogue is a company that I have uh, very much been impressed with here lately, and of course you guys all know, uh, Hogue and Doug Ritter uh, created the legendary Hogue uh, RSK MK1 G2, and since uh, you know I've handled that one and a couple other Hogue models, I've just I've, I've come to very much appreciate Hogue's quality and the fact that they're able to do that uh, and, and make their knives in the United States. So that's awesome. This knife was sent to me by Mr. Anonymous. He also donated this knife to the channel. So thank you very much, Mr. Anonymous. It's because of people like him that I'm able to bring you guys daily knife content. And it's also because of my generous patrons. Thank you so much for supporting me right now. If you'd like to check out my Patreon, get your hands on some of those cool stickers. There is, of course, a link down in the description to support me in the world to me. So the EX A01 is the automatic variant. There is also a manual variant with thumb studs and it's more of a button lock. Um, it, uh, I believe, comes in a starting price about the same, uh, and that's the uh, Hogue uh, EX01. The A, I believe, obviously standing for automatic. Uh, both of those knives will be linked down in the description, or both the, this knife and the manual version will be linked down in the description so you can take a look. I understand that not everybody is able to carry or own an automatic knife, right? So you can pick the one that meets your preferences. Let's go ahead and get a measurement of this guy overall. Overall length coming in at right exactly eight inches. Blade length coming in at exactly three and a half inches. Cutting edge coming in at about 3.3, maybe 3.4 inches overall. So that's a really nice size for a lot of people. Obviously, if you can't carry a knife with a blade length like this, you know, use your best judgment, but this is a preferable size to me. Certainly not a small knife. Let's go ahead and do some size comparisons up against the Ontario Rat Model 1, which I have finally been able to eliminate those nasty reflections in. <laughs> I've changed the lighting a bit more to get rid of most of the brown reflection whenever I put the, uh, it, it doesn't matter to you guys, it just matters to me. <laughs> up against the Ritter Hogue, uh, Ritter Hogue coming in at 8.6 inches overall. How about up against the Spyderco PM2? Spyderco PM2 is coming in at 8.3 inches overall. How about up against the Benchmade Reptilian, or in this case, the Ritter Hogue, which is an excellent size comparison. The Ritter Hogue coming in at exactly the same length, eight inches overall. I think a lot of people will find that pretty interesting. And last but not least, the Spyderco Para 3. The Spyderco Para 3 coming in at seven and a quarter inches overall. So how's the action on this guy? This is an automatic knife, and uh, I compare all side opening automatic knives to the quality that I experience with Protec knives, and guys, this knife fires just about as hard as uh, Protec knives that I've experienced. I'm actually really happy with the action on this guy. The button is not recessed, but it's it's really nice. I mean, I, I mean, like I'm very aware when my finger is on that button. The button's done really well. It's not, you know, it doesn't have like kind of, um, I guess, uh, lazy simplicity to it. They've added some texturing and some detail. It's a nice large firing button. It's very comfortable to fire, and man, it kicks. Let you guys see that again here. Bam, lots of uh, power, lots of recoil, and it is absolutely an automatic where, you know, if you hold the button down and let go of the blade, it is going to come out absolutely very smooth, and it locks up down here just fine. I will let you guys know, there is zero side to side play, but as is the case with some button locks and some automatic knives, there is a slight amount of up and down, and I mean very, very slight. Sometimes with automatic knives and button locks, I experience a little bit of up and down play. I don't think that's as much of a problem as it is with liner locks and uh, frame locks because of the nature of the locking system. This is more of a, it's a cylindrical lock that slides into place underneath the tang. And I don't think up and down play is nearly as indicative of a problem as it is with a liner lock or a frame lock because of that nature. However, I can understand why some people are bothered by that. So it's one of those things where you just kind of use your, you, you know, go by your own standards. Um, it's certainly not something I ever enjoy. I mean, obviously uh, automatic knives with no up and down uh, play whatsoever are uh, preferable, but I don't see it as a major problem in this situation. I have tried adjusting the pivot a little bit and I can get most of it out of there. It's pretty microscopic. In fact, it's not something that's even visible on camera or something that even makes a sound. It's just something that I am vaguely aware of and I feel obligated to be honest with you guys about that kind of stuff. So 
your experience may vary. This might just be um, a just one that's got you know that going on for it. The other thing that's neat is it does have a safety. Some people like safety, some people don't. I don't mind the safety. What I don't like is when the switch is very easy to accidentally uh, turn on or off. In this case, we have a switch that it, there is no doubt about the position of locked or unlocked. It is very solid and it can be adjusted so you can change the amount of pressure that's on that switch. When it is locked, the blade will absolutely not fire. When it is uh, fired out, you can turn it on and it will not disengage. That's nice, that's how a safety should function. And considering the button is not recessed on this blade, I think the safety makes a lot of sense. In some situations, people can argue, you know, the safety takes away from the point of the knife. I mean, you know, in my day-to-day uh, -day life, if I'm in an EDC and automatic knife, which I can because I live in Kansas, I appreciate that safety being there in some situations. Also, if I've got it, you know, in a place where I don't want somebody to pick it up and just be able to deploy it without understanding what it is, which is a very, very rare circumstance. And if I'm leaving it out, that's more my fault than anybody else's. But I appreciate that I have the option to simply turn that safety on and make it to where nobody can deploy that blade until the safety is back off. So it's just, it's one of those things that's there. If you like it, great. If you don't, you don't. All right, let's go ahead and do the hardware check on this guy. So we'll get out my handy dandy, gosh bless it. I'm gonna have to find a way to fix those in there. My handy handy dandy Wea uh, bit selector and Wea magnetic driver, two items that are very inexpensive and very recommendable. You can find them down in the Amazon store that I referenced at the beginning of every video. Uh, just pull up in the store and look for knife maintenance. Uh, I'm gonna guess that that, in fact, I know that the pivot is a T10 because I tried to adjust it. So we have a T10 pivot on both sides. And then I believe all of the screws, all of the additional body screws are T8. So let's go ahead and get out the T8 here. Give this a shot. Yep, T8, how about the pocket clip screws? T8, beautiful, that's great. Uh, I don't recommend taking apart an automatic knife and I think um, you know, Hogue has something in their warranty about, you know, not disassembling your knife. I would imagine like most companies, it is case by case. If you have a question about your knife, you need to take it apart because you feel like something's wrong, contact Hogue, see what the best option is, right? I'm not gonna say that Hogue will uh, absolutely deny your warranty no matter what in every circumstance if you take it apart. I just don't know and I don't speak for Hogue. So talk to them first. But if you do have to disassemble this knife, it's very easy to disassemble. And there is an extra, you know, I like to see only two body screws but technically there are no body screws on the other side. Um, so you really just have the three here and then you have the pivot, right? So I think that's great, no issue there. Let's go ahead and talk about carry profile. The first thing I'm gonna do is get a uh, measurement of the blade stock thickness so we can get that out of the way here real quick. Blade stock thickness is coming in at, really? It's 150 thousandths? That doesn't seem right. Let's try again. Okay, 150 thousandths is what they're measuring that at. Let's put it up against the uh, ZT0562, a knife that I know to have about 155 thousandths on the thickness. Uh, it is fairly close. Let's try it up against the Spyderco PM2, a knife that I know to have about 140 thousandths. It looks closer to the PM2. Somewhere between 140 and 150 thousandths there. Sometimes I trust my calipers, sometimes I don't. How about uh, thickness up against the Spyderco Para 3? It's definitely thicker, definitely thicker. Um, this is a knife that has, we can see inside of there, it is mostly solid G10. And then you have a plate there for the internal pivot system to run on um, you know, the, the steel. But on the inside there, it is just G10, which definitely adds to weight reduction. Um, but uh, yeah, it is just very thick G10. I mean, it's not monstrously thick, it's not Medford thick, but it is something to be aware of for sure. How about uh, carry profile up against the Spyderco PM2 and Para 3, two knives that have awkward carry profiles that nobody ever complains about. You can see there it is, gosh, it's just a little longer than the Spyderco Para 3, and it's definitely shorter than the PM2, and it's definitely nowhere near as tall. So uh, if it is gonna be bothersome in the pocket to some people, it will be due to excess thickness versus those two. How about we weigh it? Weight coming in at a completely understandable 4.09 ounces. It is over that ounce and inch mark, but uh, the legendary Hogue Ritter here comes in at 4.59 ounces, and I would imagine that's because of the addition of the steel cartridge liner that's inside of there. Uh, so yeah, there you go. I don't have any problem with the weight. 
If you wear really tight pants and you like to carry knives like the Spyderco Para 3 lightweight or the bug out, then this is probably not going to be your cup of tea. If you're used to carrying, you know, uh, I guess uh, the, the standard for a large knife and knives ranging anywhere from four to six and a half ounces, right? If you're like me, this is not going to be a problem for you. This is a knife that rides comfortably in jeans and the profile, despite it being a little bit thick, is one that is definitely comfortable to carry. All right, have we covered all of that? I think we have. Let's go ahead and talk about the anatomy of this knife here. So what we have are G10 scales. They're not contoured. They have this really cool honeycomb pattern on here. Now, uh, the ones that are available in the links that I provided, uh, in fact, I tried to look for this exact honeycomb pattern and I couldn't find it. There are different patterns available. There's some texture patterns that are kind of down here. There's some ones with lines. They've got different versions. Some of them are coated, right? Some of them are more or less dressy and they definitely go up from that price point that I listed before, right? Um, but uh, yeah, this is an interesting pattern that's available on this. And the nice thing is, is it certainly does provide traction. Um, I definitely feel locked in, uh, whether I'm, my fingers are contacting the scales or I'm thinking about you know, how my index finger interacts with that little cutout or scallop right there. Um, it is very comfortable to hold. It is a little bit angular and a little bit sharp out, out here on the side of the G10. This is a knife that I've, I was really gonna use it. I probably would wear gloves, in which case that's not really gonna matter to me. But just so you guys know, it's a little bit sharp in places like this, a little bit angular here. The pocket clip I can definitely feel, um, but it's not anything crazy. I've certainly experienced knives that are substantially less comfortable than this. Another thing to point out is that there's an area here that you can sort of use to choke up, but it's not its not a choil, it's just a flat area. So where you're, you know, the primary position for your hand to fall in, which is pretty much the, the rest of the handle, right? To get a four finger grip on it, which you can. I wear an XL glove, so if your hands are similar to mine or smaller, you're gonna be able to get uh, a full grip on there. But you are quite a ways from the cutting edge. So if you want to choke up and get right up next to it, you can, you're just gonna have to be cognizant about how close your finger is to that uh, initial area where the blade starts, right? But you are quite a ways. In the most comfortable position of the knife, you are quite a ways away from the cutting edge. Not that big of a deal, but it is something that kind of bothers me sometimes if I'm trying to put a lot of pressure into a cut and at the same time hold the knife that you know in a way that is comfortable to me. Um, that's gonna be a little bit weird, not anything crazy. Um, all of the hardware, everything is just perfectly fitted. There are no fit and finish issues uh, here at all. And like I said, I, I kind of like the honeycomb pattern. Um, the G10 looks great. There's really nothing to complain about here. There's some excess jimping back here and there's some excess jimping up on uh, the blade, which is very comfortable to engage. It's not sharp or aggressive at all. In fact, the blade is far and away my favorite part of this knife. They have a beautiful stonewash finish on this blade. Really, really high quality. No areas uh, on this knife whatsoever that are sharp and the blade is just perfectly done. Really, really beautiful down to the cutting edge. I am a big fan of this very uh, simple uh, drop point blade. You can see there the uh, leash, well, I wanna say Elishwitz, I think it's Aishwitz. I, I Please forgive my pr mispronunciation. I am so bad about that, but there that's the designer. I feel like a lot of you would be uh, happy to know that. I think that's pretty cool. It's not like, you know, this is a an extremely new model. I think people are fairly aware of it. And as usual, I'm pretty late to the game. Uh, the blade says EXA01 USA. This is a US knife. Then unfortunately they have some sort of excess model or serial number on there and it says 154 CM and it says Hogue and then Eichowitz. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly uh, on, the, on the blade. There's not a lot of excess here. I don't mind that or Hogue up there on the swedge. Um, I don't mind USA EX uh, A01, and I don't mind the 154 CM print, but other than that, I'd prefer they just leave everything else off of it. Um, in fact, I think I would have preferred that it said Hogue right here and uh, the designer's name back here, but that's okay. The blade is wonderfully functional. Coming down to the cutting edge, it does get reasonably thin down here. It certainly is not thick. It's also not a laser beam, but it's definitely gonna be a performance-oriented blade, especially in that very well-rounded CPM, or I'm sorry, 154 CM, which is basically the exact same thing as CPM 154. I've discussed this many times. Some steels benefit from the powder process more than others. 154 CM has a very fine grain structure to begin with, and the CPM process barely affects it at all. In fact, the difference between 154 CM and CPM 154 is literally a 5% increase, estimated by, I talked with ProTech about this, estimated up to a 5% increase in toughness on CPM 154, which is, it's not something you're gonna notice during use. So I have no problem with 154 CM on here. Uh, a lot of you guys know, 
154cm is my favorite user steel of all time. It holds a reasonable edge, it is stainless, it is reasonably tough, and it is very easy to sharpen, which is excellent for knives that are actually gonna be used, right? It's nice to be able to resharpen something that has those other properties. Uh, it's nice to be able to, to sharpen it easily. The blade is just wonderful. I have no critiques on the blade whatsoever. It's really, really nice. A little bit of uh, you know reinforcement out there at the tip, so it's not a delicate tip at all. The flat runs, oh, 55, 60%. Lots of room to drop down towards that nice, sharp cutting edge, so that's great. You can see there, there is some shouldering. That's where it's gonna wrap around that, that cylinder there, so there's a lot of surface contact. Uh, in the closed position, and then not that that matters as much. There's not really any rounding in the you know uh, the tang of the blade that interacts with the stop pin here. Um, it's uh, but it's got a reasonable amount of surface contact, and that's that stop pin is nice and large, so it's going to lock up just fine. There's a lot of surface contact between the tang of the blade that interacts with the stop pin and the um, uh, the, the uh, cylindrical you know the lock that interacts with the other part of the tang of the blade on the inside, and so that's going to be um, you know something that essentially just locks up harder and harder and harder over time. I don't think you have to really worry about lock wear as much in a design like this, and it feels very, very solid. Like I said, microscopic amount of up and down play, but that's not something that you should ever have to worry about during use, and if you're really worried about it, you can just lock the blade out, right? It doesn't seem to have, it has a little bit of effect on the, uh, the amount of, uh, the, again, let me emphasize, the microscopic amount of up and down play, it's nearly imperceptible. Um, or imperceivable, imperceptible, I don't know, whatever. My English isn't the best. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you can lock it out and I feel like it's gonna be plenty dependable. There's nothing here that would make me question the integrity of the, of the lock. This is uh, similar to a Protec design where it doesn't really have a backspace or a standoff, so the pieces of G10 just meet together. It looks okay. I think I would have preferred standoffs or a backspacer, but it's not that big of a deal. They have uh, opted to place the lanyard uh, bar in a position that's just totally out of the way of everything. You don't even see it from the front or back, which is great. So if you want to have a lanyard there, you can. If you don't care about it, then we'll just ignore it. It's not in the way of anything. I think the pocket clip is a little bit funky looking, but it is certainly fantastic in function. It has that swoop that I like. I always talk about the swoop. It kind of minimizes the amount of bill, like this MXG deep period clip, and it minimizes the amount of bill sticking up, but at the same time, it allows a lot of contact between the pocket clip and your actual pocket and the knife, right? So the retention's good. It's gonna stay in your pants, and it carries pretty darn deep. That's all the more that's sticking up out of your pocket. Lots of retention, not a lot for the pocket clip to catch on. I would imagine that Hogue would work with you if the pocket clip got broken, right? But hopefully it just gets bent out and you can just take it off, use some T8 bits, take it off and put it back on. Because it is textured underneath parts of the pocket clip, that texturing probably will eat away at the seam of your pocket over time, right? All of us have pants that have been eaten up by, you know, peel ply texturing or texturing on G10, it's just gonna be the case. I kind of would have preferred a smooth area underneath the pocket clip for that not to be the case, but it's not It's not a deal breaker, not at all. Um, the back side of the knife, they just have the uh, opposite side of the button here. It's just, to, I guess, more just to have something that looks nice. So the texturing and the look of it is more decorative than anything else. Um, you'll notice that there are uh, positions for the uh, pocket clip to be mounted for tip down. Um, I, with this being an automatic knife, I would say the best position of the pocket clip is tip up, and that's how I prefer to carry all of my knives. Think about how this is in your pants, right? If you have the safety off, right? Had to make sure it was off. If you have the safety off and this is in your pants, right? And it's sitting like this up against the back seam, and that button accidentally gets pushed because it's not recessed, well, guess what? That thing's gonna fly out at least to here and might poke you in the leg. If it swings all the way up somehow, then you've got a blade sticking straight up out of your pocket. If it's hanging like this and it's up against the back seam of your pocket, even if that button gets pushed, it's not gonna completely open up and you're probably gonna become aware of it. You're probably gonna become aware of it if it opens in your pocket either way. But I, I would say with the blade pressing up against the back seam of your pocket, it's in a much better, much safer position if it accidentally deploys. Uh, you know, if, if it's tip uh, up, uh, which is why I think the safety is a nice touch, right, on this design. Uh, the other side of the pivot um, is uh, just another T10. Um, it is uh, free spinning, so if you're gonna adjust it, they come pretty tight, and I imagine there's some at least some blue Loctite in there. You will need two separate T10s and drivers to turn one. 
that kind of stinks, right? But it's really not that big of a deal. I mean, it sucks to have to have two different drivers, but there are a lot of designs out there that share that exact same, I'm not gonna call it a feature or quality, that exact same flaw, I guess, and not a lot of people point it. It just depends on the design and who the maker is, right? So it's really not that big of a deal to me. You know, I mean, you can get a, a bit set pretty cheap, you know, even if it's not like a high quality. In fact, you could literally, <laughs> Shameless plug, you could literally buy two of these and it wouldn't break the bank. You actually, yeah, you would have to buy two because you only get one T10 bit. All right, so anyways, let's go ahead and take a look at centering here. You can say that it is absolutely, completely dead centered right on that seam, and that's great. Little things that I can complain about. I don't like how far away I am from the blade in the optimal uh, position for my hands, right? It is comfortable, but there are definitely some sharp spots here and there. There is a slight amount of up and down play. While it certainly isn't something that I think will cause an issue during use or even over time, it's just something I don't like to see, right? It's like if I feel that in a Boker Kalashnikov, okay, whatever, right? But up here at this price point, I'd really like to make sure that, I'd like to see that all of that is completely eliminated if for nothing more than just my own, you know, satisfaction after I purchase this knife, right? Again, I don't think it's gonna cause any functional issues, and it may not be the case with every single one of these, but it is the case with this one. It's very, very minor. Uh, pocket clip looks a little bit funky, but it certainly is functional. There is some uh, excess uh, you know, uh, uh, texturing underneath the pocket clip, so it's gonna fray your pants up just a little bit, right? Not that big of a deal. Anything I can complain about is very minimal here. The biggest one being the microscopic amount of blade play, and even then, it's really not that big of a deal. So final conclusion, this knife comes in at base, as far as what I'm seeing, at about $185, $186. Um, they do definitely go up higher, like I said, depending on what you're getting. You can get a manual version of this knife. I think the automatic, uh, you're definitely getting the better deal in terms of you know, what your money is going towards because the, the manual one, you don't get any discount for. Not to say that the mechanism in an automatic knife is worth more money necessarily in every situation, just feel like it makes me pers like my soul feels better about the purchase. I think if I had paid the money for both of them, I think I would feel better about the automatic one. That being said, I think it's a l just a just a touch high. Um, we're getting G10 154 CM and an automatic knife. Hogue's fit and finish and their quality is definitely great, especially for a U.S. knife. Um, I'm okay with the $186 price tag at base. Uh, I think at uh, about 170, I would have been like, wow, this is a fantastic deal. But you could say that about anything. Just about anything in this world could be you know, $5 less, $10 less, $20 less, right? So that's just my gut instinct on this. I think this is still a good buy. I think it's a quality item and I, I definitely can recommend it. Um, I like seeing US knives with these materials and at this level of quality under $200, even if they're still just a little bit off. So yeah, I appreciate what uh, Hogue is doing here. And uh, this is another example of, uh, you know, the quality that I've come to appreciate through Hogue, right? Not everybody is gonna see G10 and 154CM as appropriate materials in the price range. But again, you know, the steel and the G10 is not necessarily the part of the knife that defines the overall value. It is where it is put together, it's how it's put together, it's the final shape that it takes, how much work goes into it, and whether or not it is functional, ergonomic, right? All of that contributes to the value, and I think that this is pretty darn close to a good value. So yeah, this will be going on my most recommended knives uh, playlist, absolutely. Thank you so much to Mr. Anonymous for uh, donating this knife to the channel. I'm really happy for the opportunity to uh, handle it and, and use it now, so that's great. Anyways, guys, I think that's going to be pretty much it for today's upload. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like. If you'd like to check out my other content, I do, of course, have lots of videos of knives that are either expensive or inexpensive that I do or don't like. So check those out. And if you enjoy all my content, go ahead and click on that Metal Complex logo right there and subscribe because there's definitely more coming. Thanks again for watching, everybody, and have a great day.